Today we'll be looking at the Chapter 7 test review. Remember Chapter 7, part of it was from before spring break, so please make sure you review these targets from earlier in the unit. With our square root function for number 1 and 2, we are graphing it. Remember we graph our square root function, we want to start out with the table of the parent function. We can't take the square root of negative numbers without having imaginaries, and we don't graph imaginaries, so our first numbers we want to use are 0. We have 1, 4, and 2, 9, and 3. For our transformations, remember anything underneath the square root is going to tell us horizontally what way to shift, and we always need to remember to do the opposite. So to all of my x values, I'm going to add 3. So I have 3, 4, 7, and 12. Whatever's on the outside, is what we do to our y values. We keep it exactly as it is, so I will subtract 2, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and 1. When we go to graph this, we want to graph the values from the outside or our table with the transformations. So I'm going to start going right 3 down 2, then right 4 down 1, and we're at 7, 0, and 12, 1 would be off the graph. Remember this first point is your starting point. It should never have an arrow. So my graph is going to go up and to the right. Make sure, please, that this is a point. Do not give it an arrow from it. Target 1 there is the graphing. Target 2, which it asks us to also do, is our domain and range. So our domain is always our x values. I can see here my x values start at 3 and I use everything bigger than them. So I have x is greater than or equal to 3. My y values for my range start at negative 2, so y is greater than or equal to negative 2. Always looking at that starting point to help us with our domain and with our range. For the second one, again, I'm going to start with my parent function table. So I'm going to start with 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3. And we get that by taking the square root of all of those x values. Horizontally, I can see that my graph, always the opposite under there, is moving to the right 2. So I need to add 2. So I have 2, 3, 6, and 11. Vertically, I don't have anything on the outside of that. So vertically, my graph is not getting shifted. I don't need to transform those y values. So my first point here is going to be at 2, 0. My second point is at 3, 1. I'm at 6, 2. And I'm at 11, 3, which would be somewhere out here. So connect those points. Again, just as in the last one, 2, 0 is my starting point. It should not have an arrow. But I will use that point to help me determine my domain and my range. So my domain starts at 2, so x is greater than or equal to 2. My range or my y value, I start at 0 and I use everything bigger than that. So y is greater than or equal to 0. Target 3, we went to solving with square roots. Remember when we solve with square roots, we need to make sure that we always check our answers to make sure that they work and we don't have extraneous solutions. When you solve your square roots, first thing you always need to do is isolate a square root. So in number 3, I'm going to subtract 7 from both sides so that my square root is isolated. So I have 5 equals the square root, negative 1 minus 26. To get rid of that square root, I square both sides of my equation. I know 5 squared is 25. And the square root undoes, or sorry, the squaring undoes my square root, so I'm left with negative 1 minus 26x. I'm going to add 1 to both sides. 26 equals negative 26x, and we divide by negative 26. So x equals a negative 1. To check that, we're going to plug that back into our original equation. So I'm going to replace the x. So I get the square root of negative 1 minus 26 times negative 1 plus 7. Well, negative 26 times negative 1 is a positive 26. Positive 26 minus 1 gives me 25. So that simplifies to the square root of 25 plus 7. 
The square root of 25 is 5, and 5 plus 7 is 12, which is what we need it to equal. So we know negative 1 is a solution. On number 4, I already have both of my square roots isolated, so I'm going to go ahead and square both sides. So I have 18 minus b equals b minus 10. I'm going to add b over, so 18 equals 2b minus 10, and add 10 to both sides. So 28 equals 2b. Dividing by 2, I get b is equal to 14. Again, check your answers. So when I plug this into the left-hand side of my equation, I get 18 minus 14, which is the square root of 4, which is 2. On the right-hand side, so we want to see do these equal, I get 14 minus 10, which gives me the square root of 4, or 2. Since that checks out, I know 14 is a solution. On number 5, my square root is also still isolated, so I'm going to go ahead and square both sides. We need to be careful on this. Remember when we square, we're squaring the entire side. So now I need to do k plus 3 times k plus 3, and we're going to have to distribute. On the right-hand side, my square root goes away, and I'm left with 5x plus 11. When I distribute here, I have k squared plus 3k, plus 3k, plus 9. That equals 5k, plus 11. I see that I have a quadratic, so I want to move everything to one side. Before I do that, I'm going to combine my like terms. Then I'm going to subtract 5k, and I'm going to subtract 11. So now I have k squared plus k minus 2 equals 0. We can use our AC method to solve this, so I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 2, and those two numbers need to add to 1. So multiplying to a negative 2 and adding to a positive 1, we're going to have 2 and negative 1. Since my A value is 1, I can just go ahead and place those in my factored form. So I have x plus 2, x minus 1. We're going to set those equal to 0, so x plus 2 equals 0, and x equals negative 2, x minus 1 equals 0, and x equals a positive 1. Make sure you check your answers. So I'm going to start with negative 2. So I need to see does negative 2 plus 3 equal the square root of 5 times negative 2 plus 11. Negative 2 plus 3 is 1. 5 times negative 2 is negative 10. Negative 10 plus 11 is 1. And I know the square root of 1 is 1. So negative 2 works. I'm going to plug in 1. So plugging in the left-hand side, I get 1 plus 3. And the right-hand side, I get the square root of 5 times 1 plus 11. 1 plus 3 is 4. 5 times 1 is 5 plus 11 is 16. The square root of 16 is 4, so I know that both of these solutions work. Targets 4 and 5, we're graphing the cube root function along with finding the domain and range of them. Remember, for cube roots, we have a different parent function table to use we can take the cube root of negative numbers. So we want to start with negatives. So I have negative 8. The cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. Negative 1, we get 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 8, 2. Again, taking the cube root of all of our x values to get that table. Just like we did with square roots, whatever is inside, we're going to do the opposite to our x values. So I'm going to add 4 to all of my x values. So I have negative 4, 3, 4, 5, and 12. On the outside here, I have a minus 2, so we're going to subtract 2 from all of our y values. So I have negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and 0. 
we always graph the values with both transformations done, so we're going to use those outside values to do it. My first point then is going to be negative 4, negative 4. Then I have 3, negative 3, 4, negative 2, 5, negative 1, and 12, 0. I'm going to put the point somewhere out there just so I can help with the shape of the graph. Remember, this graph does not have a starting point. It keeps going in both directions forever. Since it keeps going in both directions forever, I know my domain is all real numbers. I also know that my range is all real numbers. This graph goes to the left and right, giving us the domain of all real numbers. It goes up and down, giving us the range of all real numbers. This will be true for every single one of the cube root functions. For our second graph, I'm going to start again with that parent function. So I have negative 8, negative 2, negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 8, 2. To my x values, I'm going to subtract 5. So I'm at negative 13, negative 6, negative 5, negative 4, and 3. To my y values, I'm going to add 1. So I'm at negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Again, graph your outside values. So negative 13, negative 1 is not going to fit on there, but I can approximate that. Negative 6, 0. Negative 5, 1. Negative 4, 2. And 3, 3. Again, connect. Remember, you should have an arrow going both directions. Your graph should be curvy. My domain, again, it's going left and right forever is all real numbers. And my range is also all real numbers. Target 6, we're switching from graphing to solving. Just like the square roots, the first thing we want to do when we are solving rational exponents is to isolate it. So in number 8, I have this exponent of 3 halves on P. It's not on that 2, so the first thing I need to do is move that 2 over. So I'm going to divide both sides by 2. When I divide by 2, I'm left with P to the 3 halves equals 125. In order to get rid of that exponent, we're able to raise both sides to the reciprocal power. So we'll flip 3 halves to 2 thirds. And then I have 125 to the 2 thirds power. The reason we can do this is remember when we multiply these exponents, we get 1. So I'm left with p to the first. We want to put 125 to the 2 thirds power in your calculator. When we do 125, use the caret key. And then we do 2 divided by 3. Make sure that is inside the parentheses, otherwise it's not going to give you the right value. So we get p equals 25. On number 9 here, we have to first isolate whatever has the power of the 3 halves to it. So I need to isolate this entire parentheses. So I'm going to start by subtracting 7. So I get 108 equals 4 times negative 47 minus 2n to the 3 halves power. I'm going to divide then both sides by 4. When I divide the right hand side by 4, I'm left with just what is raised to that power, which is what we wanted to do. We wanted to isolate whatever we had to the 3 halves power. That's because these 4s cancel each other out. 108 divided by 4 is 27. Now that it's isolated, we're going to take it to the reciprocal power. Reciprocal of 3 halves is 2 thirds. Plug 27 to the 2 thirds in your calculator, and you're going to get 9. 2 thirds times 3 halves is just 1, so I'm left with negative 47 minus 2n. I'm going to add 47 to both sides. So I get 56 equals negative 2n, and dividing by negative 2n equals a negative 28. That was everything that was on your quiz. 
other than target 7 here. After target 7, starting at target 8, this was all the new material from after the quiz. Target 7, we're just rewriting everything from rational exponent form to radical form or radical form to rational exponent form. If I'm in rational exponent form, remember whatever your denominator is, is your root. So this tells me I should take the fourth root of 5x. Whatever is in your numerator is the power we take that to. So x to the 1 half, that 2 has to be my root. Remember, for square roots, you don't have to write that 2, so you could just have the square root. It's to the first power, so again, you could put the 1 there, or we can just leave it alone. So number 12, we're going to do everything in reverse. We're going to take our radical and we're going to rewrite it with a rational exponent. Remember, even if you don't have a number in the root, we know that there should be a 2 there. So this is going to become 6x. The 2, remember, is the denominator of my exponent, and then the 5 is the numerator. On 13, then, I have 10r. 4 is my denominator of my exponent. There is no exponent here, so we know these are all to the first power, so I put a 1 in its place. Target number 18, we are using, or sorry, target number 8, we are using our exponent rules. So remember the order here, just kind of work on exponents to exponents. You have parentheses, we want to do that. Otherwise, everything else we can pretty much do whenever you want. Whatever you see, go ahead and start there. So I'm going to start with this denominator. I'm going to multiply those exponents together, and I get a to the eighth. In my numerator, I have a to the fourth and a squared. So when I multiply those together, I add those exponents. So I get a to the sixth, and I still have b to the fourth. I have to still continuing to simplify because I should only have one of each letter at the end. Right now, I have that a to the sixth on top and a to the eighth on the bottom. So we're going to subtract those exponents. 6 minus 8 gives me a negative 2. So I'm going to move that to the denominator to make it positive. I'm going to keep that b to the fourth on top. On 15, I have lots of exponents to exponents. So let's start with the inside parentheses there. I have that negative 2xy all to the negative 2 power. So I'm going to rewrite this denominator. I'm going to still have that x to the negative third, but I'm going to distribute that negative 2 exponent. So I have 2 to the negative 2, x to the negative 2, y to the negative 2. I still have that negative 1 exponent on the outside, and I still have the 2x squared up top. I'm going to combine my like terms in this denominator. So I have x to the negative third and x to the negative two. So that gives me x to the negative fifth. I still have that two to the negative two. I still have the y to the negative two. And then I still have this negative one exponent on the outside. I'm going to distribute that negative one exponent to the inside. I still have my 2x squared up top. Distributing that negative one in, I have two squared x to the fifth, and y squared. Now I don't have any negative exponents to worry about, so I'm going to go ahead and simplify by dividing. I have 2 to the first over 2 squared. Subtracting my exponents, 1 minus 2 gives me negative 1. I'm going to put it on the bottom and make it positive. x squared minus x to the fifth, so I do 2 minus 5, which gives me negative 3. I'm going to move it to the bottom so it can be positive. I have y squared, which stays on the bottom. We're going to put a 1 in our numerator as a placeholder. Target 9, we're simplifying our square roots, so we want to break those down as much as possible. Remember, you always want to try to pull a perfect root out of it. So 192, we want to look for the biggest perfect root that goes into there. And when we do that, we can pull out, let's see. Okay. One thing you could do is you could break it up into 16 and 12. That's not the biggest root that you can pull out. However, if that's something you find, remember that's not wrong. We just have to keep going from there. 16 is a perfect root. The square root of 16 is 4, so I could take 4 out. Then I'm going to break down 12 even further. I know 12 is 4 and 3. 
and 4 is a perfect root, so I can do the square root of 4, which is 2. Then any numbers on the outside, including this 5 from up top, we're going to multiply together. So I have 40 coming outside of my root, and this 3 is left inside. When I look at my a, my a is to the first power. It's a square root. 2 doesn't go into 1. We can't take the square root of a, so a stays underneath my square root. For 17, we're going to start by breaking down 48. I know 48 is 16 times 3. Again, looking for my perfect squares. If you don't know that, go through, use your calculator, divide by perfect squares in your calculator. Square root of 16 is 4, so that comes out of my square root. I can't take the square root of 3, so it's going to be stuck under. I'm going to multiply 4 and 3 together, so I have 12. And then underneath my square root, I have that 3. Then we'll go to x to the 4th. So remember we have a square root, 2 goes into 4 2 times. So I can pull x squared out. I don't have anything left over, so we won't have any x's left underneath. When I look at my y cubed, 2 goes into 3 1 time. So I can bring y or y to the 1st out. I have 1 left over, so I have y stuck underneath. Then I have z to the 4th. 2 goes into 4 2 times, so I have z squared on the outside. Nothing left over, so that's my final answer. Target 10, we're trying to evaluate. Remember when we evaluate these, we always want to start at the inside. So when I look at the inside, what I'm talking about is I want to look at that g of negative 2. Remember that means I'm going to plug negative 2 into my g function. So g of negative 2 means I'm doing 3 times negative 2, replacing that x with negative 2 minus 3. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. Negative 6 minus 3 is negative 9. So I'm going to replace g of negative 2 with negative 9 then. And I'm going to find h of negative 9. So now I'm plugging negative 9 in for my x and h. So I have negative 4 times negative 9 plus 2. Negative 4 times negative 9 is a positive 36. And 36 plus 2 is 38. So looking at 19, I'm starting with my g function again, finding g of 5. Again, I'll replace my x with 5. 5 minus 5 is 0. So I know g of 5 equals 0. So I replace that g of 5 with a 0. So now I have f of 0. So I have 0 squared minus 0, which is just 0. On target 11, it says find the inverse of each function by making a table, then graph the function and its inverse. So first thing I need to do is make a table. So I'm going to have an xy table. I'm going to do 0, 1, 2, 3. So I'm plugging these x values into this equation. So I have negative 0 minus 1, which is negative 1 over 5, which gives me negative 1 fifth. I'm plugging 1 in. Negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. get negative 2 fifths. Plugging 2 in, I get negative 2 minus 1, which is negative 3, so negative 3 fifths. Plugging 3 in, I get negative 3 minus 1, so negative 4 fifths. Remember to find the table of my inverse then. I switch my x and y values. So my new x values are going to be negative 1 fifth negative 2 fifths, negative 3 fifths, and negative 4 fifths. My new y values are 0, 1, 2, 3. So we're going to graph this. Okay, We're going to graph both of our functions. So my first functions, I'm at 0, negative 1 fifth. I'm at 1, negative 2 fifths, 2, negative 3 fifths, 3, negative 4 fifths. Okay, My slope is very small there. My slope is actually negative one-fifth. When I graph my inverse at negative one-fifth, I'm at zero. Negative two-fifths, I'm at one. Negative three-fifths, I'm at two. Negative four-fifths, I'm at three. 
sorry, my board is not very good right now. So make sure that those aren't on this value of negative one, but we're getting closer and closer and closer. And those are gonna be my inverse and the original function. So for 21, we're gonna do the same thing. Start with by making our own table. So I'm going to pick 0, 1, 2, 3. Again, you can pick whatever x values you want. I'm just trying to pick easier values to plug in. 0 times 3 halves is 0. 0 minus 3 is negative 3. 1 times 3 halves is 3 halves. 3 halves minus 3 is negative 1 and a half. Or you could also do negative 3 halves. 3 times 2, I'm sorry, 3 halves times 2 is 3, 3 minus 3 is 0, and then last but not least, we have 3 halves, so again, continue to plug these in for your x values, so 3 halves times 3 minus 3 gives me a positive 1.5. For my inverse table, I switch those x and y values, so my y values become 0, 1, 2, 3, my x values are negative 3, negative 1.5, 0, and 1.5. Graphing both functions, I'll start with my original one. I was at 0, negative 3. I'm at 1, negative 1 and a half, 2, 0, and 3, 1 and a half. Connect your points to make that line. My inverse function or the table in red started at negative 3, 0, negative 1 and a half, 1. 0, 2, and 1.53. Target 12 then says state if the given functions are inverse, prove using the composition of functions. So for this one, this is where we want to see does h of f of x equal 0 and does f of h of x, sorry, not equal 0, they both need to equal x. So to find h of f of x, so let's do that in black. I'm going to take my f of x function, so my 3 eighths x minus 3 halves, and I'm going to plug all of that in for x in h of x. So my h of f of x starting with that h of x function, is negative 1 minus 4 fifths. And then in for x, I plug that entire f of x function. So 3 eighths x minus 3 halves. So we need to simplify this, and we need to see when we simplify this, does it equal just x? So we're going to start by distributing negative 4 fifths in. So I'm going to do negative 4 fifths times 3 eighths. So I get negative 1 minus 0.3x. And then I'll do 4 fifths times 3 halves. It's a negative 3 halves, so we have to make sure to include that negative in there. And I get minus, sorry, plus 1.2. Now, right from there, I can tell when I combine those terms, I'm not going to get x, so I know that they are not inverses. You don't have to continue past there. So number 23, we're going to do the same thing, just instead of h and f. I want to see if g of f of x equals x, and if f of g of x equals x. So let's start with g of f of x. So g of f of x tells me to plug my f of x function in for x and g. So I have 3, in parentheses, negative 3 plus 1 third x plus 9. Distribute the 3 through, I get negative 9 plus x plus 9. So that simplifies to just x. Since the first way worked, you have to show the second way works. Sometimes one way will work, but the other won't. So I'm going to do f of g of x. So this time I'm plugging g of x in for the x of f of x. So negative 3, let me move this down so we have enough room here. So I have negative 3 continuing with my function 
plus one third times x, which is going to be 3x plus 9. I'll distribute with my one third. I have negative 3 plus x plus 3, which simplifies to just x. Since they both just equal x, we know that they are inverses of one another. Target 13, I can find the inverse of the function algebraically. So this is when we want to switch x and y. We're not verifying anymore. We're trying to find what the inverse would be. Remember, f of n really means y. So when I rewrite this, I'm going to state it as x, switching my x and y, equal 15 minus 10y over 3. Now our goal is to solve for y. To solve for y, I'm going to multiply both sides by 3 to get that 3 out of the denominator. So 3x equals 15 minus 10y. Subtract 15 from both sides. Those aren't like terms, so we get 3x minus 15 equals negative 10y. Divide everything by negative 10. So I get negative 3 tenths x. 15 over negative 10, simplify, they're both divisible by 5, to plus 3 halves equals our inverse. So remember, we use that negative 1, so f to the negative 1 of n. 25, I'm going to do the same thing, so switching x and y, so x equals 3 over y plus 1 plus 1. Start by subtracting 1 from both sides. So I have x minus 1 equals 3 over y plus 1. I need to get y by itself, but y cannot be in the denominator. So now I'm going to multiply both sides by y plus 1 to get it out of the denominator. The thing is, is I'm not going to distribute here. So right now I have y plus 1 times x minus 1 equals 3. Instead of distributing, I'm going to divide both sides by x minus 1, because remember, we really want this y to be on its own. So now I have y plus 1, my x plus 1's cancel, equals 3 over x minus 1. To get y alone, we subtract 1 from both sides. So I get y, which in this case, what letter do we use up here, was our g of x, so my g inverse of x, we know it's the inverse function once we get y by itself, equals 3 over x minus 1 minus 1. Okay, those are all the targets on the test. Please make sure you go through this review. Come in and ask us any questions that you have on it.